This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ian Bartholomew. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter six, part eight. As each of the two parties at the court of James had the support of foreign princes, so each had also the support of an ecclesiastical authority to which the king paid great deference. The supreme pontiff was for legal and moderate courses, and his sentiments were expressed by the nuncio and by the vicar apostolic. On the other side was a body of which the weight balanced even the weight of the papacy, the mighty order of Jesus. That at this conjuncture these two great spiritual powers, once, as it seemed, inseparably allied, should have been opposed to each other, is a most important and remarkable circumstance. During a period of little less than a thousand years, the regular clergy had been the chief support of the Holy See. By that see they had been protected from episcopal interference, and the protection which they had received had been amply repaid. But for their exertions, it is probable that the Bishop of Rome would have been merely an honorary president of a vast aristocracy of prelates. It was by the aid of the Benedictines that Gregory the Seventh was enabled to contend at once against the Franconian Caesars, and against the secular priesthood. It was by the aid of the Dominicans and Franciscans that Innocent the Third crushed the Albigensian sectaries. In the sixteenth century, the pontificate exposed to new dangers more formidable than had ever before threatened it, and was saved by a new religious order, which was animated by intense enthusiasm and organized with exquisite skill. When the Jesuits came to the rescue of the papacy, they found it in extreme peril. But from that moment the tide of battle turned. Protestantism, which had, during a whole generation, carried all before it, was stopped in its progress, and rapidly beaten back from the foot of the Alps to the shores of the Baltic. Before the order had existed a hundred years, it had filled the whole world with memorials of great things done and suffered for the faith. No religious community could produce a list of men so variously distinguished. None had extended its operations over so vast a space. Yet in none had there ever been such perfect unity of feeling and action. There was no region of the globe, no walk of speculative or of active life, in which Jesuits were not to be found. They guided the councils of kings. They deciphered Latin inscriptions. They observed the motions of Jupiter's satellites. They published whole libraries, controversy, casuistry, history, treatises on optics. Alcaic odes, editions of the fathers, madrigals, catechisms, and lampoons. The liberal education of youth passed almost entirely into their hands, and was conducted by them with conspicuous ability. They appear to have discovered the precise point to which intellectual culture can be carried without risk of intellectual emaciation. Enmity itself was compelled to own that, in the art of managing and forming the tender mind, they had no equals. Meanwhile, they assiduously and successfully cultivated the eloquence of the pulpit. With still greater assiduity, and still greater success, they applied themselves to the ministry of the confessional. Throughout Catholic Europe, the secrets of every government, and of almost every family of note, were in their keeping. They glided from one Protestant country to another under innumerable disguises as gay cavaliers, as simple rustics, as Puritan preachers. They wandered to countries which neither mercantile avidity nor liberal curiosity had ever impelled any stranger to explore. They were to be found in the garb of mandarins, superintending the observatory at Pekin. They were to be found, spade in hand, teaching the rudiments of agriculture to the savages of Paraguay. Yet whatever might be their residence, whatever might be their employment, their spirit was the same. Entire devotion to the common cause, implicit obedience to the central authority. None of them had chosen his dwelling-place or his vocation for himself. 
whether the Jesuit should live under the Arctic Circle or under the Equator, whether he should pass his life in arranging gems or collecting manuscripts at the Vatican, or in persuading naked barbarians in the southern hemisphere not to eat each other, were matters which he left with profound submission to the decision of others. If he was wanted at Lima, he was on the Atlantic in the next fleet. If he was wanted in Baghdad, he was toiling through the desert with the next caravan. If his ministry was needed in some country where his life was more insecure than that of a wolf, where it was a crime to harbour him, where the heads and quarters of his brethren, fixed in the public places, showed him what he had to expect, he went without remonstrance or hesitation to his doom. Nor is this heroic spirit yet extinct. When, in our own time, a new and terrible pestilence passed round the globe, when in some great cities fear had dissolved all the ties which hold society together, when the secular clergy had deserted their flocks, when medical succour was not to be purchased by gold, when the strongest natural affections had yielded to the love of life, even then the Jesuit was found by the pallet which bishop and curate, physician and nurse, father and mother, had deserted, bending over infected lips to catch the faint accents of confession, and holding up to the last, before the expiring penitent, the image of the expiring Redeemer. But with the admirable energy, disinterestedness, and self-devotion which were characteristic of the society, great vices were mingled. It was alleged, and not without foundation, that the ardent public spirit which made the Jesuit regardless of his ease, of his liberty, and of his life, made him also regardless of truth and of mercy, that no means which could promote the interest of his religion seemed to him unlawful, and that by the interest of his religion he too often meant the interests of his society. It was alleged that, in the most atrocious plots recorded in history, his agency could be distinctly traced, that, constant only in attachment to the fraternity to which he belonged, he was in some countries the most dangerous enemy of freedom, and in others the most dangerous enemy of order. The mighty victories which he boasted that he had achieved in the cause of the Church were, in the judgment of many illustrious members of that Church, rather apparent than real. He had indeed laboured with a wonderful show of success to reduce the world under her laws, but he had done so by relaxing her laws to suit the temper of the world. Instead of toiling to elevate human nature to the noble standard fixed by divine precept and example, he had lowered the standard till it was beneath the average level of human nature. He gloried in multitudes of converts who had been baptized in the remote regions of the East, but it was reported that from some of those converts the facts on which the whole theology of the gospel depends had been cunningly concealed, and that others were permitted to avoid persecution by bowing down before the images of false gods, while internally repeating paters and eyes. Nor was it only in heathen countries that such arts were said to be practised. It was not strange that people of alt ranks, and especially of the highest ranks, crowded to the confessionals in the Jesuit temples. For from these confessionals none went discontented away. There the priest was all things to all men. He showed just so much rigour as might not drive those who knelt at his spiritual tribunal to the Dominican or the Franciscan church. If he had to deal with a mind truly devout, he spoke in the saintly tones of the primitive fathers. But with that very large part of mankind, who have religion enough to make them uneasy when they do wrong, and not religion enough to keep them from doing wrong, he followed a very different system. Since he could not reclaim them from guilt, it was his business to save them from remorse. He had at his command an immense dispensary of anodynes for wounded consciences. In the books of casuistry which had been written by his brethren, and printed with the approbation of his superiors, were to be found doctrines consolatory to transgressors of every class. There the bankrupt was taught how he might, without sin, secrete his goods from his creditors. The servant was taught how he might, without sin, run off with his master's plate. 
the panda was assured that a Christian man might innocently earn his living by carrying letters and messengers between married women and their gallants. The high-spirited and punctilious gentlemen of France were gratified by a decision in favour of duelling. The Italians, accustomed to darker and baser modes of vengeance, were glad to learn that they might, without any crime, shoot at their enemies from behind hedges. To deceit was given a license sufficient to destroy the whole value of human contracts and of human testimony. In truth, if society continued to hold together, if life and property enjoyed any security, it was because common sense and common humanity restrained men from doing what the society of Jesus assured them that they might, with a safe conscience, do. So strangely were good and evil intermixed in the character of these celebrated brethren, and the intermixture was the secret of their gigantic power. That power could never have belonged to mere hypocrites. It could never have belonged to rigid moralists. It was to be attained only by men sincerely enthusiastic in the pursuit of a great end, and at the same time unscrupulous as to the choice of means. From the first, the Jesuits had been bound by a peculiar allegiance to the Pope. Their mission had been not less to quell all mutiny within the Church than to repel the hostility of her avowed enemies. Their doctrine was in the highest degree what has been called, on our side of the Alps, ultramontane, and differed almost as much from the doctrine of Bossuit as from that of Luther. They condemned the Galician liberties the claim of the ecumenical councils to control the Holy See, and the claim of the bishops to an independent commission from heaven. Lainez, in the name of the whole fraternity, proclaimed at Trent, amidst the applause of the creatures of Pius IV and the murmurs of the French and Spanish prelates, that the government of the faithful had been committed by Christ to the Pope alone, that in the Pope alone all sacerdotal authority was concentrated, and that through the Pope alone priests and bishops derived whatever divine authority they possessed. During many years the union between the Supreme Pontiffs and the Order continued unbroken. Had that union been still unbroken when James the Second ascended the English throne, had the influence of the Jesuits, as well as the influence of the Pope, been exerted in favour of a moderate and constitutional policy, it is probable that the great revolution, which in a short time changed the whole state of European affairs, would never have taken place. But even before the middle of the seventeenth century, the society, proud of its services and confident in its strength, had become impatient of the yoke. A generation of Jesuits sprang up, who looked for protection and guidance rather to the court of France than to the court of Rome and this disposition was not a little strengthened when Innocent the Eleventh was raised to the papal throne. The Jesuits were, at that time, engaged in a war to the death against an enemy whom they had at first disdained, but whom they at length had been forced to regard with respect and fear. Just when their prosperity was at the height, they were braved by a handful of opponents, who had indeed no influence with the rulers of this world, but who were strong in religious faith and intellectual energy. Then followed a long, a strange, a glorious conflict of genius against power. The Jesuit called cabinets, tribunals, universities to his aid, and they responded to the call. Port Royal appealed, not in vain, to the hearts and to the understandings of millions. The dictators of Christendom found themselves, on a sudden, in the position of culprits, they were arraigned on the charge of having systematically debased the standard of evangelical morality for the purpose of increasing their own influence, and the charge was enforced in a manner which at once arrested the attention of the whole world. For the chief accuser was Blasé Pascal. His intellectual powers were such as have rarely been bestowed on any of the children of men, and the vehemence of the zeal which animated him was but too well proved by the cruel penances and vigils under which his macerated frame sank into an early grave. His spirit was the spirit of St. Bernard, but the delicacy of his wit, purity, the energy, 
and the simplicity of his rhetoric, had never been equalled except by the great masters of Attic eloquence. All Europe read and admired, laughed and wept. The Jesuits attempted to reply, but their feeble answers were received by the public with shouts of mockery. They wanted, it is true, no talent or accomplishment into which men can be drilled by elaborate discipline. But such discipline, though it may bring out the powers of ordinary minds, has a tendency to suffocate rather than to develop original genius. It was universally acknowledged that, in the literary contest, the Jansenists were completely victorious. To the Jesuits nothing was left but to oppress the sect which they could not confute. Louis the Fourteenth was now their chief support. His conscience had, from boyhood, been in their keeping, and he had learned from them to abhor Jansenism quite as much as he abhorred Protestantism, and very much more than he abhorred atheism. Innocent the Eleventh, on the other hand, leaned to the Jansenist opinions. The consequence was that the society found itself in a situation never contemplated by its founder. The Jesuits were estranged from the Supreme Pontiff, and they were closely allied with a prince who proclaimed himself the champion of the Galician liberties and the enemy of ultramontane pretensions. Thus the order became in England an instrument of the designs of Louis, and laboured, with a success which the Roman Catholics afterwards long and bitterly deplored, to widen the breach between the King and the Parliament, to thwart the nuncio, to undermine the power of the Lord Treasurer, and to support the most desperate schemes of Tyconnel. Thus on one side were the Hydes and the whole body of Tory churchmen. Powis, and all the most respectable noblemen and gentlemen of the King's own faith, the States-General, the House of Austria, and the Pope. On the other side were a few Roman Catholic adventurers, of broken fortune and tainted reputation, backed by France and by the Jesuits. The chief representative of the Jesuits at Whitehall was an English brother of the order, who had, during some time, acted as vice-provincial, who had been long regarded by James with peculiar favour, and who had lately been made clerk of the closet. This man, named Edward Peter, was descended from an honourable family. His manners were courtly, his speech was flowing and plausible, but he was weak and vain, covetous and ambitious. Of all the evil counsellors who had access to the royal ear, he bore perhaps the largest part in the ruin of the House of Stuart. End of Part 8